Welcome back to the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies. This series, After War, Before Peace, is a series that we began immediately after the signing of the ceasefire document that followed 44 days of fighting, during which Azerbaijan, with serious military and strategic support by Turkey, attacked the Armenians of Gharapagh. And at the conclusion of the war, a very asymmetric conclusion, a ceasefire document was signed that left many, many questions unanswered about the path to peace. And in this series, we've tried to explore some of those questions. As we near the end of this series, we are going to speak about the countries in the region that have been seriously impacted by the changing configurations. Today, our conversation is about Iran. And we have two guests. Uh, we will speak first with uh, Dr. Hamid Reza Azizi, who was in Berlin, and then that will be followed by a conversation with Professor Yervan Abrahamian, who is acknowledged as one of the leading historians of modern Iran. Before I introduce them, and before I introduce my colleague, uh, co-host and co-guest in this series, Emil Sanamian, who is a Caucasus analyst and has been following conflicts in the region, specifically the Gharapakh conflict, of course, now for decades. Before I do all of that, let me just say a couple of things about Iran. Uh, the most important thing that probably needs to be said is that Iran has, to its credit, many say, maintained neutrality during these several decades of real and simmering conflict between Armenians of Gharapagh and Azerbaijan, and of course, Armenia and Azerbaijan. The other thing that needs to be said is that Iran has a sizable Azeri minority and not nearly as large, but nevertheless, a sizable Armenian minority. And both of these communities are not in diaspora. They did not leave Azerbaijan or Armenia to get there. These are uh, communities that have been there for generations. And these are just two of the many interesting factors in this discussion of Iran, a regional power, uh, Persian Empire has been there for centuries, together with the Persian Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire, of course, the Caucasus kept changing, uh, um, kept changing its nature, if not borders and allegiances and sovereignties. So it is in that context that we're going to carry on today's conversation, and I'm going to welcome Emil Sanamian. Greetings. Hello, everybody. Emil, if we're going to do this, we're winding down. We're having a conversation about Iran. Um, soon we'll have a conversation about Georgia, and then we will conclude this series, even though I don't know that we have come any closer to peace than when we started out. Um, let me introduce our first guest. Dr. Hamid Reza Azizi is an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin. He is an assistant professor, was an assistant professor of regional studies at the Shahid Beheshti University, and is a guest, was a guest lecturer at the Department of Regional Studies at the University of Tehran. Hamid Reza Azizi, thank you for joining us here um, after War Before Peace. Thank you for having me. I would like to start with just a general question, and that is, how was the war followed in, in Tehran, both by the elites as well as by the public? What did the media say? Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, let me start uh, with uh, saying a very basic fact that I think uh, the recent war in Karabakh uh, indicated a serious and evident shift in Iran's policy toward the South Caucasus and especially this armenian Azeri conflict. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, over the past three decades, actually, Iran um, has always tried to maintain a policy of neutrality, while at the same time, in reality, it wanted uh, to maintain this, uh, you know, uh, status quo, that uh, frozen conflict, for a variety of reasons, of course, that might not be quite relevant to this discussion now. But, uh, you know, um, actually, on the, on, uh, on the other hand, on the uh, side of the Azeris, this uh, kind of neutrality 
uh, was always, uh, you know, uh, being interpreted as Iran taking side with Armenia. Uh, so uh, for, for these reasons, actually, I think uh, the start of the war uh, put Iran in a very difficult situation from four uh, uh, main aspects, I think. And this is uh, going to be, I think, uh, kind of key to uh, your question. Uh, first, Iran uh, knew that uh, given the military superiority of, of Azerbaijan over Armenia and also the uh, kind of full support, Turkey's full support uh, for Baku, the Armenian side uh, didn't have real chance uh, for victory. Uh, at the same time, when Russia started to kind of abandon its traditional policy of uh, supporting Armenia and, uh, you know, prefer to stay more or less neutral in this conflict, uh, this uh, fact, you know, became actually more evident for the Iranians. Uh, so uh, despite the fact that Iran was worried about the change of uh, in the balance of power in the region uh, in the favor of Turkey and, uh, and its, uh, and of course, other uh, supporters of Azerbaijan, for example, Israel, which are either rivals or, or enemies of Iran, but uh, Iran couldn't actually, you know, uh, oppose uh, this uh, Azeri operation. Uh, the second aspect was that Iran never uh, kind of recognized uh, formally, ne never formally recognized uh, Armenian control over, over Karabakh and uh, didn't also recognize uh, the Artsakh uh, Republic. Uh, Iran always uh, saw these territories as, as occupied lands. For this reason, uh, it couldn't actually object, uh, you know, uh, Azeri's attempts to uh, kind of retake those territories. The third factor was uh, the uh, pressure posed by uh, Azeri minorities that, um, you know, considerable minority. Before you, you get to that, also. if that's okay, let's yeah. explore the, the first two a little bit. Um, and, sure. you know, obviously Israel is, is one of the topics that needs to be discussed and, and you know, you, you went there. Um, Emil, do we want to talk about that, the Azerbaijan-Israel relationship and what that does to Iran's perceptions of the conflict? Uh, we could, of course, uh, the, the Israeli-Iranian rivalry uh, is well known. Uh, it's a sort of slow-moving, um, uh, very uh, complicated, complex conflict. Uh, and uh, Iranian uh, Iranians are watching Israel's actions in Azerbaijan uh, with a certain degree of worry. There have been cases where evidence that uh, Israel uh, used Azerbaijani territory for uh, operations into Iran, uh, both uh, of intelligence and possibly also of diversionary nature. Uh, so there is a considerable um, uh, issue there. Um, and the Iran uh, had uh, made efforts to sort of maintain a strong dialogue with, uh, with the Azerbaijani government to try to limit uh, whatever uh, a cooperation Azerbaijan was offering Israel. Uh, so that has been a major uh, factor uh, in, uh, in that relationship. Secondary, um, no less important, of course, the role of Turkey. And uh, we know that from um, the past couple of decades, a relationship between uh, Iran and Turkey has overall been a stable one with, of course, certain uh, difficulties. But in general, uh, relationship has been um, better than in the past, and uh, Iran had made sure to sort of maintain that relationship as well. Uh, and particularly, Turkey played a key role in sort of uh, uh, helping Iran avoid uh, Western sanctions uh, in terms of uh, you know financial transactions, etc. So, uh, for Iran, of course, this uh, the tandem of Turkey and Azerbaijan sort of had a had a, a major uh, major importance, and of course, Israeli role there was also. So, uh, something that so but in, in both cases, and um, Hamid Reza, you, you kind of alluded to this, I, in both cases, both in the considerations of Turkey and Turkey's role and considerations of Azerbaijan and its Israel relationship. So the uh, Iran's perception of this conflict are colored by those two other very important interests, concerns, problems. Uh, the, uh, Turkey, Iran, regarding Syria and, and, and elsewhere, and of course, Iran and, and Israel, and then with Israel being so close now to Iran's borders through Azerbaijan. So how much of the, the response, and you said the change of policy, is colored by those third-party relationships? Yeah, actually, that's, uh, that was the point I was uh, going to reach, because um, 
what I want to say is that Iran was uh, kind of seeing, was witnessing this uh, change in, in the regional order and new actors uh, becoming involved in the conflict, you know, its rivals and enemies, uh, Turkey and, and, and Israel becoming more active in the region. But uh, because of these factors that I mentioned, and also, as I said, the pressure of the Azeris, Azeri minorities, and also because uh, Russia as the main actor, as the dominant power in the region, did not uh, do anything uh, to prevent the Azeris, for example, you know, to, uh, to go ahead with their plans. Iran had no option but to uh, kind of accept the realities on the ground. And that was the reason, for example, when I say uh, there was an evident change in, in approach, I, uh, specifically, I'm specifically referring to uh, the remarks by Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei, who uh, clearly said that yeah, those uh, territories are occupied and uh, he supported the uh, so-called liberation of, of those territories. Uh, so I think uh, those were the reasons and it wasn't like Iran was not aware of, uh, of uh, the changes and uh, the uh, new set of you know, risks uh, posed by those uh, third parties, Israel and Turkey, but uh, it had little option to, to maneuver. So what it did actually was to uh, try to adapt itself with this new situation, but taking side with, by taking side with uh, the uh, maybe uh, the the uh, uh, victorious party uh, with Azerbaijan in order to preserve another set of interests. For example, after the end of the war, uh, we saw that Iran uh, welcomed this so-called three plus three initiative uh, proposed by Turkey. Uh, in uh, terms of you know economic cooperation uh, between uh, the countries, so that was kind of you know chain, turning uh, the potential security and geopolitical risks into actual economic opportunities. That was let's, Iran's calculation. Before before you explain that, go further. Let's explain the three plus three. Yeah, I mean. Um, that uh, proposal, uh, when uh, Iran's foreign minister Zarif uh, went uh, to a regional tour after the end of the war to the three uh, countries of the South Caucasus and also to uh, Turkey and Russia in order to, uh, you know, talk with, the, uh, with, uh, with those countries' officials about the situation. There was this idea proposed by the uh, Turkish side on a kind of cooperation. Three means, of course, the three countries of the South Caucasus plus uh, the three uh, neighboring uh, countries, neighboring powers, Iran, uh, Turkey and Russia. Of course, there are uh, serious challenges in this way because uh, the war has ended, but the situation is far from normal in terms of Armenia and Azerbaijan being uh, willing to cooperate with each other. But uh, at least this is the potential that Iran uh, thinks uh, it can exploit in order to, uh, you know, adapt itself with this new situation and uh, at, at the same time as uh, the security scene in the region has changed, it can gain some economic benefits. Uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, one of the calculations. If I could also note, uh, if we compare to what transpired in the early 90s, um, Iran, Iran's position on this conflict it did not undergo any fundamental change. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, Iran, Iran's uh, position was also default recognition of Azerbaijani claims on Karabakh. Uh, following uh, Azerbaijani military setbacks, Iran uh, offered uh, and provided considerable uh, humanitarian and also military support to Azerbaijan. This is very not very well known, but uh, there was an Iranian military delegation in Azerbaijan that was sort of training Azerbaijani forces. Azerbaijani forces could use uh, Iranian territory to sort of go around the Armenian forces and outflank them, etc. This is back in 1993-1994. So, in a sense, the change, the position did not undergo change, even though uh, you know uh, position of say Turkey had considerably changed, the role of Israel considerably changed. Uh, Iran, in a sense, remained the status quo power in this conflict and. Uh, a status quo in not just in preserving the conflict, but sort of going with the flow wherever it might go. In 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 trying to uh, design a, a place for itself in this in the outcomes of this conflict, it makes sense, of course, that Iran would want to see the benefits of something like a three plus three where really regional relations are more open, particularly economically. I mean, Armenians have always said that 
you know, Iran is Armenia's one of two only paths out to the outside world, huh? Georgia to the north and Iran to the south. But the reverse in some ways is also true in that with the West trying to isolate Iran, Armenia is also a path out to the world for Iran. Given that, if, if you were sitting in on the conversations of those determining uh, Iran's policies in the short term, certainly, uh, and the medium term, what are the fears or the concerns that you would list? I mean, I will start with, for example, Russian troops on the ground far closer than they've ever been. Um, and what are um, the uh, some yeah, of the th others? Let's start with this one. I don't think that uh, Iran sees uh, Russian, uh, the presence of Russian troops close to the borders uh, as uh, a kind of threat. Uh, you know, this is one of the areas where uh, the perception of states toward each other matters. And uh, not only Iran does not see Russia as a, as a military threat, but actually the main area of cooperation between the two countries over the past several years has been this military and, and security uh, uh, you know, field. And uh, you know, there's another factor, I think, uh, from the Iranian perspective, um, I believe that uh, the presence of Russian military troops close to the borders is preferred over the presence of Turks, for example, or, or the Israelis. Uh, so uh, this is actually how it lived in Iran. And at the end of the day, uh, Iran has long accepted, you know, Russia's role as uh, the dominant power it's near, in its near abroad, including in the South Caucasus. So nothing has changed, basically, uh, in that regard. But, uh, you know, actually one of the reasons, first, one quick point about uh, what I said about, uh, you know, the change in Iran's position. Of course, what uh, was mentioned in terms of Iran's support for Azerbaijan during the first period of war in the 1990s was true, but that was the first phase of war. After that, given the, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, challenges uh, in uh, Iran's relations with Azerbaijan, Iran actually changed uh, its, its track and its inclined toward uh, supporting Armenia. And that's been one of the things always mentioned by the Azeris in terms of saying that, claiming actually that Iran uh, take side uh, with uh, with Armenia. So that's that's for it. But um, in this uh, specific conflict, I think Iran reached the conclusion that ending the war, uh, regardless of the result, regardless of the winner, is preferred uh, over, you know, uh, just, uh, uh, for example, taking this side or that side. Because uh, there was, as, as I said, there was ending a growing... this particular war, these 44 days. Ending, the, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, for example, the more the war was, you know, uh, going on, the more was the possibility of Israeli activities in terms of military surveillance close to the Iranian border. There was a drone uh, coming into the Iranian borders and was it was shot down and believed to be uh, Israeli. And also, uh, there was reports of uh, Turkey's mercenaries uh, being dispatched from, uh, you know, uh, Syria uh, to close to the Iranian border. Iran was fighting those, uh, you know, radicals in Syria, far from its borders, in order to preserve its security. So you can imagine how uh, dangerous the situation was when these reports were published and how Iran perceived that. So Iran wanted to just jump in any kind of uh, initiative proposed by others, by Russia, by Turkey, or anyone else, just to finish this war and then see what comes next. Uh, that was actually uh, what happened, I think. I I Iran was caught by surprise, I think, uh, in, that, uh, in the sense that the war was uh, became that extensive and, uh, you know, uh, the result was totally in favor of Azerbaijan, I think. Yeah, the asymmetry was a surprise to everyone, uh, internationally, domestically. Uh, Foreign Minister Zarif's trip, I don't follow Iran on a, you know, closely, but I don't know when the last time was that the Foreign Minister picked up and did that kind of five-country tour. Uh, what came out of it on his return. There was the three plus three possibility that didn't seem to go far. Uh, and it's interesting to ask about why that doesn't, hasn't really found, you know, gotten traction. W were there any other changes in the way in which uh, the war was discussed publicly, media sentiments? If I could add yeah, to that, uh, whether whether uh, the issue of uh, Karabakh or the Caucasus in general 
uh, is part of sort of pre-election debate in Iran, uh, whether, uh, you know, it's been instrumentalized, I don't know, by political sides in uh, sort of debates. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's already too much on the plate of Iran's foreign policy that, uh, you know, uh, the South Caucasus uh, in general and Karabakh in particular has not become a debate in the presidential election and it's not expected to become. But uh, in terms of public opinion, how it reacted and in the media, uh, there was, you know, the, the general sentiment, what I got was a kind of dissatisfaction over uh, the fact that, you know, based on I Iranian perception, this uh, long, uh, you know, historical attachment that you mentioned in the beginning, for example, that Iran effectively lost its, uh, you know, uh, historical and cultural and, uh, you know, uh, civilizational zone of influence and there are other actors active there and uh, people, experts, you know, uh, started to criticize Iran's inaction uh, in this uh, in, in this conflict and the fact that Iran just uh, it it seemed that Iran was just sitting idle by and and as I said uh, that was uh, what was really happening on, on uh, you know uh, among the Iranian politicians they were just uh, waiting for uh, for the result of the war so uh, the general uh, mood was kind of negative of course among the Azeri minorities. There was a sense of victory. There was some gatherings celebrating, for example, uh, uh, the victory of Iran. But uh, I would say there is a kind of polarity uh, in this regard. But uh, overall, in term, in geopolitical and security terms, and in terms, uh, uh, yeah, especially in geopolitical terms, there was a sense that Iran has lost uh, lost its leverage and its influence in a very important neighboring region. This was pre-war or post-war. This, this started loss. actually, yeah, this started, uh, I would say, at the middle of the war and intensified uh, by the end of the war when it became clear, especially especially when uh, Russia and Turkey, uh, you know, sat together and uh, like uh, wrote that uh, uh, for, for ceasefire and then, of course, Russia uh, kind of naturally imposed uh, those terms. But anyway, Iran was seen as being effectively excluded uh, from uh, the, uh, you know, arrangements for ending the war and for any in the post-war arrangements and, and uh, political scene in the region, I think. A final question. Does that mean that it will seek to have greater engagement in the period to come during this period that continues to be unstable and unpredictable? Uh, you know, uh, to answer this, I uh, need to mention a very basic fact about Iranian foreign policy and its neighboring regions. The fact is that uh, the South Caucasus or the post-Soviet space, if, if you may say, uh, has never been a kind of priority in Iranian uh, policy. Uh, the priority in, it, uh, in the Iranian foreign policy has always been first to uh, kind of manage its relations with the West and then even more importantly, to expand its influence in the Middle East. Uh, you know, whenever Iran has uh, paid attention to uh, to the South Caucasus, actually, has been the times that there's there's been a crisis going on there, and Iran has been, as I said, caught either by surprise or uh, just trying to, you know, uh, to, to manage the situation. So I would say uh, the, the whole policy, Iranian policy toward the South Caucasus has been mostly reactive. It hasn't be, uh, have a kind of active approach to our region. So I don't think in the coming, uh, in the short term or to midterm period, uh, at least, uh, I don't see any sign of a kind of a huge change in favor of a more active policy uh, by Iran in the region. Dr. Hamid Reza Azizi, thank you very much for participating in this conversation. I don't think we'll have another opportunity in this series, but I cannot imagine that there will be further opportunities to discuss Iran, Armenia, the Caucasus region, and what comes next. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to invite uh, Dr. Yervant Abrahamian, who, as I said, is widely regarded as the preeminent scholar in modern in the studies of modern Iran. He is distinguished professor of history at Baruch College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. 
Um, Professor Abrahamian Yervant, thank you very much for joining us. I know you were listening. I even saw you taking notes. Um, I will ask, I think, you know, Emil and I will just kind of go over some of the same territory and ask for your take. Uh, let's start with Hamid Reza's final comment, that is that um, Armenia, the Caucasus, is really not going to be prominent in Iranian, on the Iranian foreign policy agenda anytime soon. Yeah, I fully agree with Hamid Reza. I think his analysis was basically what I would say. Where I would somewhat um, put the emphasis is if you put yourself in the shoes of the Iranian government, uh, they're on one hand concerned about public opinion and the Azari population because it's so large. They have to be concerned about that. But when they're also concerned about state interests, the survival of the Islamic Republic, then other things dominate. And I think they're much more actively influenced by state interests rather than more public opinion. From state interests, there is from their perception an axis of evil basically existing against Iran. And the axis of evil is uh, Tel Aviv, Baku, and now increasingly uh, Ankara. And from their perception, uh, the Caucasus really fits into a larger picture. Uh, clearly in this last war of Karabakh, Israel was fully supporting Azerbaijan, so was uh, Turkey. And from the Iranian point of view, this is actually a very dangerous a uh, uh, future. Um, after all, Iran um, is has because it has a Azari population. That itself is not a threat to Iran because actually the Azari population is fairly well integrated into Iranian nationalism. But what from their concern is that Baku has actually territorial claims on uh, Iran. It talks about the unification of northern Azerbaijan, the Azerbaijan Republic, with the province of Azerbaijan. And if you're sitting in uh, Tehran, this is a direct threat, basically, to uh, state sovereignty. Um, we should and, make clear, Professor Abramian, we should make clear that what you're referring to is a region of the Islamic Republic of Iran called northern Azerbaijan. I'm sorry, exactly. it's called Azerbaijan. There are two provinces of Azerbaijan, yes, east and west. And since uh, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, the Baku has actually been talking about, you know, that their brothers in the south want to be united with their brothers in the north. And this has been encouraged by Israel. So from Iranian point of view, there is a threat, an existential threat to the Iranian state where you have your main enemy is actually encouraging the dismantling of the Iranian state. Um, so I, I, I would say the moderates in Likud talk about regime change, but the less moderate Likuds actually talk about dismantling the Iranian state. Uh, and they have maps of basically it's out of dated maps of 19th century Iran as a mosaic of different ethnic groups. And of course, the Azaris would be a major ethnic group uh, breaking apart the state into smaller mini state, which would be interests of the, Iran of the Israeli state. Uh, but obviously, it's a mortal threat to the Iranian state. So from state uh, 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 decision makers, uh, there is a looming threat from Baku, especially since it's uh, supported by uh, Israel. And now with Turkey coming in, uh -huh. it becomes a, even a, a greater threat to the future of Iran. Greater threat again because of the first consideration, that is Baku's possible transgressions. It's not yes. Turkey for its own sake that's a threat. It's Turkey well, as... No, there there's an additional concern. I would, if I was in Tehran, a decision maker, 
As long as the Turkish Republic talked about the boundaries of Turkey in 1921, that's one thing. But under Erdogan, they're talking about more of a pan-Turkism. And again, this brings back bad memories for Iran. In the First World War, in fact, the Ottomans invaded Azerbaijan on the argument that Azerbaijan really belonged to the Ottoman Empire. So if, if uh, Erdogan picks up this sort of Ottoman language, this is, uh, from Tehran's point of view, this is no longer state politics, this is pan turkinism And of course, they can see this happening in Syria, where Turkey is also uh, much more expansionist at the expense of the Syrian state. So from their point of view, if they're looking in the long terms, there is a potential really threat from uh, Baku. Emil, do you want to jump in? Yes, uh, this is this is always very hard to read. I mean, especially for non-experts of Iran such as us, uh, as far as uh, the dynamics of uh, uh, ethnic uh, identity activism in uh, in Iran. Uh, of course, we had sort of the the high point uh, at the end of 1940s, where there was Soviet uh, support for Iridentism in Iran, in uh, Iranian Azerbaijan. Uh, but since then, it sort of ebbed and flowed, and there not seem to be uh, major uh, violent incidents uh, involving, say, Azerbaijani nationalists uh, compared to uh, other minorities of Iran, Kurds or uh, Baluchis or Arabs. Even. Uh, how would you measure that? Where is that uh, process been going in the last couple of decades? Will this war, can this war substantially in Karabakh substantially influence? sort of reignite uh, uh, ethnic activism in Iran? I, I don't think so, because I think that very much the Azari population uh, was very much integrated into Iran, partly because of Shiism. There's a lot of Iran, Iranian identity that transcended uh, Azari identity. And the brief um, sort of plot toy uh, uh, of the Soviets with Azerbaijan was very brief. And actually, if we look at it carefully, it was much more <laughs> instigated by Bagarov in Baku rather than Stalin in Moscow. It was much more local politics. And it was very brief and was triggered off by the British and American oil companies trying to get an oil concession in Azerbaijan. As long as that was dropped, the Soviets were more than interested in getting out and not basically getting involved in that issue. So it wasn't, the, the brief Azerbaijan crisis was not an authentic local issue. It was something that created briefly from Baku and it stopped in 1946 actually, once uh, the oil agreement was basically dismantled. Um, since, yep. the, since then, uh, you find actually there's much more integration of the all the minorities really into Iranian identity. Uh, you find, in fact, most uh, many of the great uh, literary figures in Persian are originally Azari. Uh, they have there's no problem about that. Khamenei himself is from Azerbaijan, his family. So. It's not, it's not really an issue there, but it could be a potential issue if it's instigated from abroad, from uh, whether Israel or from Baku. Yeah, but can we talk also about the north-south, uh, I don't know if it's an axis, but Iran and Georgia, those relations, the importance of them, where they place on Iran's agenda, because Georgia too is undergoing all sorts of questioning about it. it's it's place now in the region, given this new Turkey-Azerbaijan uh, enhanced tandem? Um, I, th I think I agree with Hamid Reza, but these are actually minor because for Iran, they're bigger, basically uh, dangerous. These are interests, but it's interesting that um, in Iran, in the, in the press, no one's really raised the issue that, of course, many of these regions uh, for long periods of time were part of Iran. <laughs> so no one is talking about reoccupation of Karabakh or Armenia or Georgia because historically they belong to Iran. 
But th that type of historical memory is is not really uh, uh, in force in present day politics. What about present day economic relations, Iran, Georgia? Uh, again, it's, it's important, but it's not that important compared to the Gulf, India, China, Europe. Uh, it plays a minor role. In terms of Turkey's role and Turkey's sort of growing uh, presence in the Caucasus and generally uh, growth as a, as a power, uh, what is how do how do Iranians view that? Uh, it seems there is considerable Iranian emigration to Turkey, at least uh, economic economically driven immigration, uh, and it seems like uh, Turkey is seen maybe as as kind of a role model. Does that have an impact in in how? Uh, Iranian um, Azeris, Iranian, uh, uh, other Iranian minorities might be looking at their government and their identity maybe uh, coming uh, under some kind of a pressure. I, I don't think so. I mean, it's one thing to, uh, especially dissidents who have to leave Iran, go to Turkey, whether they become Turkified, it's, I, I, I doubt that. Uh, there, there, There's a distinct, uh, I think, uh, national identity there that functions. And also, there's also the question of rivalry between Iran and Turkey and Central Asia that comes into the picture. Um, and so not I, just Central I, Asia, so many places. Yeah. Um, and also, you find that, of course, uh, dis dissidents in Iran who dislike the uh, lack of the, uh, democracy uh, it's hard for them then become supporters of Erdogan or Aliyev. So <laughs> they're put in a predicament if their opposition to the regime is a question of liberalism. It's hard to then be identified with uh, the present the Turkish or uh, Baku governments. Yervant, what does... Uh what what does Iran think? I, I'm asking you to read minds. Um, the overland corridor that Azerbaijan, Turkey expect to create somehow through some portion of Armenia in some format, whether it's a leased structure or, you know, it's, it's so unclear. But certainly this overland corridor is something that is on the agenda. It was part of the, the ceasefire agreement. What are Iran's thoughts about that? Well, it probably it, it's a downside for Iran because so much of the trade before from Azerbaijan proper to Nakhchivan went through Iran. Uh, so there will be some diminishing of that, but I don't think it's a major concern uh, because afterward, even before that, there were other routes from Azerbaijan to Nakhchivan, and it's not a huge uh, economic uh, issue. It's not a, it wouldn't be a huge economic loss for Iran. So if we were to end this conversation on, with the following conclusion, that the conflict and its aftermath are not really of supreme concern for Tehran, and they will watch what happens in the region, but there are no specific minefields, specific targets that need to be challenged or dealt with with Iran. Is that fair? Yes, I would say yes. But I mean, but in terms of long terms for Iran, there is a concern about what Israel and Turkey uh, and Baku basically have on their agenda. Uh, but I would say the recent war has a silver lining, actually, which we tend to overlook. Um, in a way, the loss of peripheral areas around uh, Karabakh, I think, strengthens Armenia's uh, uh, both a legal and a legitimacy a law argument that this is a question of um, national self-determination. Um, and it's not so much a question of occupied territories or state sovereignty. Uh, it's a question of when you have a certain area population that predominantly wants self-determination, that 
internationally and since 1917 has been a premise of international politics that uh, self-determination trumps over other rights, even sovereign rights. So for the Iranian government in the past talked about occupying territories, meaning Armenia was occupying Azari territories. That argument is weakened because there, I think the question now is uh, self-determination of Karabakh. Yervant, I think even those who might agree with the technicalities of what you say, that in fact those territories not being under Armenian control in some way uh, strengthens the self-determination claim, there are two problems. One is that the integrity of Ghadapar itself, the NKO, the nagorno ghadapar Autonomous Oblast, what became the self-declared Republic of uh, Artsakh, is gone with the southern portion now under Azeri control, uh, it becomes very hard to sustain the uh, integrity of that political entity. And the other, of course, uh, is that the way that the Azerbaijani leadership, the president obviously, is approaching this post-war situation leaves no room for that sort of uh, intelligent, thoughtful, long-term thinking and negotiating. So, Emil, do you agree? Well, I mean, well, for yeah. now, uh, certainly. Yes, I agree. Uh, sorry, uh, just to conclude the point. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, you know, things, uh, things like international norms don't uh, generate uh, political outcomes on their own. There has to be sort of alignment of uh, political interest, as we saw in some other cases where uh, you had conflicts and uh, there was sort of unilateral uh, recognition, be that, you know, Kosovo uh, and Serbia and uh, the regions of Georgia that were recognized by Russia, etc. So unless that uh, comes about, uh, we will have a very uncertain uncertain situation in Karabakh and uh, uh, particularly g g challenging geography right now uh, makes clear that current uh, extent of Armenian control m makes the area indefensible without uh, third force being present. So uh, essentially, uh, by extension, uh, this defeat in, in, in Karabakh also brings yeah. about uh, Armenia's uh, dependence on, uh, on Russia is, as, as guarantor of Armenia's security. Which is why those territories were taken under Armenian control in the first place for the defensibility. Right. So if you don't, if you have peace in the region, you don't need defensible borders. But until then, there's a challenge. But Yervan, you get the last word. Well, I, I think I mean, as long as the Russian troops are there, that gives some security. Yes. And of course, the Russians can't oppose the notion of self-determination because they use that argument in a, whether it's Ukraine or Georgia. So. True. Thank you, Professor Yervan Tabrahamian. You've been, uh, we're just very proud to have you. And I think this conversation about Iran uh, needs to be had and needs to be understood. So thank you again for your participation. Thank you, Emil Sanamian, as always. And thank, thank you. you to all of you for following us here at the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies and for, af in for these conversations about after war, before peace. I'm not sure that we are finding answers, but I think it's important to understand the questions that have to be asked to see who the players are in the region, what the interests are in the region, to see really how we get from war to peace. Thank you and continue to follow us on the USC Institute of Armenian Studies channels all over the social media and on YouTube. Thank you again. Thank you, Hamid Reza. Thank you, Yervant.